Alright guys, so in this video we're going to talk about speed, density and pressure and what I've decided to do is to do a question on each. So um, let's first of all just look straight uh, at the first question. Uh, it says that Peter goes for a walk and he walks 15 miles in 6 hours. Work out Peter's average speed, give your answer in miles per hour. So what we need to do in this, uh, what we need to do now in this, we focused on speed so we need to use the formula uh, distance equals speed times time. So distance equals speed times time. But what we can also do, we can also actually do a distance speed time triangle. Hopefully most of you are aware of this, where you've got distance at the top and you've got S for speed and T for time. Now what you can do, you might be wondering why I've wrote this like a triangle. Well, it's interesting because all you have to do so you don't get confused with like which of the two terms, whether it's one divided by the other, or one times the other, or whatever. All you have to do is look at this triangle, and the thing that you want to find, cover up with your thumb the thing that you want to find, and whatever you see, whatever you can still see in front of you is what you need to do. So basically, if you, in this case, it says work out Peter's average speed, so we need to work out the speed. So in this case, what we can do, we can actually cover up we can actually cover up, imagine we're covering up our sp with our thumb the thing that we want to find. So we want to find speed, so we cover up the speed and we can see what's actually left is D over T. So that's what we have to do, we have to, we have to work out distance divided by time. So we can see, we can see here that uh, speed will be distance over time. Now the great thing is we know what the distance is, uh, it's 15 miles, and we also know what the time is, it's 6 hours. So all we've, all we've really got to do is divide, and it's actually average speed as well, because it could the speed could change during the 6 hours, but ultimately the total distance was 15 miles in the space of 6 hours. Anyway, onwards, uh, we've got distance of 16 miles, so we can write 16 miles in here divided by 6 hours. So if we go over to our calculator and we work out 60, uh, 15 divided by 6, we end up with 5 over 2, or 2.5. So we can put in here 2.5. Now, it says give you answer in miles per hour. Now, fortunately, we've got everything that we need already in terms of units. We don't have to exchange anything because we've already got miles over here. And we're already dividing by the number of hours. So once we've done this calculation, we end up with miles per hour. So we've already got the required units. And uh, we are ready to go and move on to the next question. Now, it says 5 miles equals 8 kilometres. And it says Sunita says that Peter walked more than 20 kilometres. Is Sunita right? You must show all your work in. Now, we know, don't we? We know that Peter has walked 15 miles. So we need to find a way of converting from... Uh, we need to find a way of converting from miles into kilometres. Now, it already tells us here that 5 miles equals 8 kilometres. So we can write this above here. We can say that 5 miles equals 8 kilometres. And we are interested in how far Peter has walked in kilometres when he's walked 15 miles. What we can see, we can see that if we times 5 by 3, that gives us 15. And that's how we've gone from 5 miles to 15 miles. So to go from 8 kilometres to the thing that we want to actually uh, find, we can, just see, we can just see that 8 times 3 is equal to 24 kilometres, like so. Uh, so we can see... Peter, that means basically Peter has walked 24 kilometres. So because Peter has walked 24 kilometres, we can see what's more than 20 kilometres. Therefore, uh, Sunita, Sunita is right. And we are good to go. Uh, we've done that question. Uh, another way you could have done this, you could have actually worked out, well, you could have worked out, well, 
how many kilometers are there in one mile and you could have you could have taken eight divided by five uh, we could have gone to the calculator and been like well eight divided by five is 1.6 kilometers per mile and then we could have simply just taken the 1.6 and times that by 15 and had we have done that we still would have got 24 and got to the same answer but different ways of getting to the same answer so whatever method uh, is easier for you now let's move on to the next uh, question now this is to do with density this time so i'm glad i've actually uh included this um it's to do with density and it gives us the density but ultimately it's the mass that we want to find so it says the diagram shows a solid triangular prism it says the prism is made from metal and the density of the metal is 6.6 grams per cubic centimeter calculate the mass of a prism so what we need to do here we need to make use of a formula don't we uh, and the formula is the following that um I'll write that again we've got so we've got mass is equal to the volume times density because we know that the density equals mass over volume so I've just rearranged this equation so that mass equals volume times density now the mass is the thing that we want to find because it asks us at the very end to calculate the mass of a prism do we know what the volume is? Yes, we do. Uh, once we actually work out uh, the volume of a prism, and we also know what the density is. So let's first work out the volume and see how we get on. So you might be wondering, well, how do I work out the volume? And what we have to do first, we have to use another formula, and we have to use the following, that volume is equal to the area of CS, cross-section, and the cross-sectional area is the bit that I've shaded in blue there. And we need to times that by uh, length. So the length of our prism. Okay. Uh, so first of all, we need to work out the cross-sectional area. Well, the cross-sectional area of our triangular prism will be half times base times height. Because that's the same as the, as, as the um, formula for the triangle. So we can say, well, that's the same as half times base times height, times the length. Do we know what the base is? Yes, we do. We can see that the base is five. We know the height is 12, and we also know the length is 15. So we can now work this out and work out the volume of our cross-section, uh, the volume of our solid triangular prism. So first we've got the cross-sectional area, which is a half times base times height. So we've got a cross-sectional area of 30 centimetres squared, and then we're timesing that by our length, which is 15. And that gives us a volume of 450 cubic centimetres, or centimetres cubed. So we've got the volume now. Uh, all that's left now is that we work out the mass. Uh, so we take mass equals the volume, which is 450, times our density, which is 6.6. .6. Uh, so if we take 450 and we times that by 6.6, .6, that gives us a uh, that gives us a value of 2,970. But what about the units? What about the units? Well, what we can do here, we can see, can't we, the volume is in centimeters cubed, and we can see that the density over here it says it says grams. It actually says grams per centimeters cube so we've got grams per centimeters cube so what we're actually doing if we if we just consider the units like so and we times the units together we can see we've got centimeters cubed times grams per centimeter per centimeter cubed which is grams over centimeters cubed the centimeters cubed cancels out leaving us with units uh, which is just grams we could change that to kilograms if we really wanted to, but I think it's more appropriate to follow the units directly from uh, that which is given in the density of the metal. Now, uh, we're moving on now to pressure, okay, and the notion of pressure 
um, how we can apply that uh, in this following problem. So it says a force of 70 newtons acts on an area of 20 centimetres squared. Okay. Now, the force is increased by 10 newtons. The area is increased by 10 centimetres squared. Helen says that the pressure decreases by less than 20%. Is Helen correct? You must show how you get your answer. So, this can be quite overwhelming. There's a lot of information here that they've just thrown at us out of nowhere in this question. So my advice would be to not really, don't really worry about any of this stuff. Almost pretend that this stuff isn't even there. Just focus on this first statement here. It says a force of 70 newtons acts on an area of 20 centimetres uh, squared. Well, I think it's a good idea if we work out what the pressure is to begin with. Let's work out the pressure just off that bit of information that's available. Okay, so we can call this stage one. We can go over here and we can say, well, okay, we've got P for pressure equals F for force divided by A for area. Now we know, don't we, that the force is 70 newtons and we know that the area is 20 centimetres. So our initial pressure before we've increased any force or increased any area is going to be 70 divided by 20. So we can go over here and we can say, well, 70 divided by 20 gives us a pressure of 3.5. Now, you might be wondering what the units are for this. Well, we can see, can't we? Well, force is in newtons and area is in centimetres. So that's going to be newtons per centimetre squared. Okay, and um, we can even put the units in here as well. So just to make it a bit more obvious of where these units have come from. So we know that we've got 3.5 newtons per centimetre squared to begin with. We're now ready to move on and see what's going on here. So it now says, it now says, does, doesn't it? It says the force has increased by two by 10 newtons and the area was increased by 10 centimetres squared. So let's now work out, uh, I'm going to put, I'm going to put here initial pressure because that's what the pressure initially was before all these changes were made. And then we also want to find out what the final pressure is. So let's do that. Let's use the same formula again. Pressure equals force over area. Now, the force was 70 newtons. Now it's saying that it's now it's saying that it's increased by 10 newtons. So that means our new force will be 80 because 70 newtons plus 10 newtons is 80. It says the area is increased by 10 centimeters squared. So that means that we have down here 30 centimeters squared because the pre because the area is increased by 10 centimeters. So we add that on top of the 20. So our new pressure is going to be 80 divided by 30. So we've now got 2.6 uh, recurring. So let's just go for 2.67 newtons per centimetre squared. So that's our final pressure. And now we can look at all the other bits which have been uh, which I've just omitted. Now it says, Helen says, Helen thinks that the pressure decreases by less than 20%. Is Helen correct? So we can clearly see that the pressure's gone down. It's gone down from three, it's actually gone down from 3.5 to 2.67. But we want to know, has the pressure decreased by less than uh, by less than 20%. So what we need to do, we need to find out well, what percent, what percentage of the initial pressure have we actually got? So if 3.5 basically is 100% our initial pressure, what percentage is the 2.7, uh, 67? And we can do that by simply just taking the, um, we can simply take 2.67 we can divide that by 3.5. So our percentage is 
670 divided by 3.5 times 100. Uh, we can keep, we can stick with the more accurate value, which is already in the calculator, so we can do that. We divide that by 3.5, we times by 100, and we can see, can't we, that we have gone from 100% to 76.2%. So, so what we've got, this 2.67, the 76.2% of the initial pressure of the initial pressure. So when Helen turns around and says you the pressure decreases by less than 20%, we've got to be very careful with this, with how it's being worded. It says, it says the pressure decreases by less than 20%. Now, looking at this, what percentage decrease have we got here? We can see our percentage decrease is actually 24.8%. That's the percentage decrease, okay? So, the, if anything, the, press, the, the pressure increase, it, the pressure's decreased by more than 20%, not less than 20%, because our percentage, because our percentage decrease over here it's 24.8, but it's so easy to think, it's so easy to think that, uh, that it's the other way around, but it's actually, we can see that it was 24.8% for percentage decrease, so it's actually, it's actually more than 20%, because 24.8 is more than 20. So actually, uh, we can go over here, we can say, well, this is actually more than 20%, therefore, Helen, is wrong. Okay, and we've justified that answer. We've done all this working out, but I hope it hope hope that makes sense anyway. Uh, quite a long worded problem that was, and uh, the sort of problem that could throw off a lot of uh, foundation tier uh, candidates. Okay, uh, but uh, the key is with this type of question is to simply. Uh, just break it down just 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 attack this problem one bit at a time okay don't worry about the rest of the stuff uh just just focus on the first bit and then move on to the second bit you know you want to you want to just put tiny little building blocks together to come up with a final solution if you try and do everything at once it can get very very confusing so in the next video we're going to move on to a brand new section uh to do with uh, angles and parallel lines. So I shall see you in the next video.